I recently read the book The Willpower Instinct. So how self-control works, why it matters, and what you can do to get more of it by author Kelly McGonigal. She describes the definition of willpower or willpower challenge as the following. Basically something that's a competition between two parts of yourself. Neuroscientists are famous for saying even though we have only one brain, we actually have two minds. And we are completely different people depending on which mind is active or which systems of the brain are more active. And so willpower challenge is anything where those those two versions of yourself have competing goals. So you can be the very same person, but depending on your mindset, depending on your energy, depending on your stress levels, your brain is going to see this willpower challenge in a different way. And people often say, oh, we know we're supposed to do that stuff already. We just don't want to do it. And this was really interesting fundamental gap between what people wanted and what they thought they wanted. And people were very identified with this persona, this version of themselves. They felt like deep down they were the person that wanted the candy bar. And this other person that wanted the banana, who is that? You know, that's not really me. And they realize that they don't need to know what is the right thing to do, what's the healthy thing to do, or tips for stress management or productivity. They need to feel like this person. They need to know how to be this person as a default, rather than walking around feeling like they had to resist this core self that only wants to have immediate gratification and that never wants to do anything difficult. So when are you not the best version of yourself? When your prefrontal cortex, the area of the brain that where willpower seems to live, is inhibited, for instance, with alcohol or lack of sleep. Basically, when you sleep less than seven hours, you're sleep deprived. The prefrontal cortex is the first area of the brain that becomes sluggish and less responsive. Research thinks that there's been such an increase in obesity in the last couple of decades is because people are sleeping less than they used to. So if people are not sleeping enough, they're more susceptible to temptation or things that we normally try to control. So what the prefrontal cortex does is remember um, future goals and that's that inhibits the brain that thinks you want short-term relief. The procrastinator, follow that link through, not doing your yoga exercises. The ability to remember who you are and what your big goals are is dependent on the ability of this this area of the brain to use energy well. And sleep deprivation is one of the main things that can come in the way of that. And it's not just sleep that impacts how the physiology of your brain works or how good your brain uses its energy. A couple of other things that seem to really strengthen the ability of the brain, the frontal regions, to do what they're supposed to do to help you control impulses and find motivation. And here are the four things that seems to make your brain into a willpower machine. So that's sleep, meditation, physical exercise, and low glycemic or a plant-based diet. And both meditation and physical exercise shown that not only make your brain more efficient with using the self-control system, but they actually make the system bigger and better connected with the reaches that they're supposed to be controlling. And again, it can be a very quick time course to see this benefits. Meditation 10 minutes a day, in a couple of months time, their brain will look different, that this area will be better connected. The people who work out in a, on a regular basis that used to be sed sedentary. Again, studies show that at l as little as a couple of months as a regular workout, their prefrontal cortex are bigger and denser and better connected. So these are the two things that you can do that actually train the physiology of your willpower. Also, what you eat has a very big influence on whether or not your brain is able to be this better version of yourself. There's something about having a big spikes of blood sugar levels and big drops of blood sugar levels that really screws up how the brain uses energy. You need your brain, again, to be an energy efficient machine. If you're gonna be walking around the world and that's sort of better you mindset rather than that basic impulse you. And research in shows that shifting to a more plant-based diet or vegan diet, even better, changes how the way the brain functions. And it has a lot to do with g what's going on with your blood sugar levels. So these are all things that we think about of requiring willpower, right? We think, all oh, right, I have to sit down and force myself to meditate. I have to oh, work out. I have to say no to cake and have two apples every day. But really, we rarely think about the fact that actually not doing these things maybe is part of what makes it so difficult to begin. And there's a kind of curve that when we're first started, we're kind of using willpower. But everything on this list takes a little bit of willpower to begin. Ends up giving you back far more willpower than it takes. And not just for this challenge. So it's not just that exercise makes it easier to exercise. A study shows that exercise makes it easier to eat right or to not spend too much money or to stop procrastinating or to pay better attention. All these things have 
have a kind of global training effect of what you can think of as your willpower muscle. I'd like you to think about a time that you had a willpower failure. And my question is, do you think that feeling bad about like a little bit of regret or guilt, self-criticism, does that help us improve for next time? Can that be a source of future willpower? Kelly says that if you think that the, the key to greater willpower is being hard on yourself, you're not alone, but you are wrong. <laughs> study after study show that self-criticism is consistently associated with less motivation and worse self-control. One study tracked uh, procrastination over an entire semester with students and found out that students who were harder on themselves because they procrastinated were more likely to procrastinate again on, on subsequent exams. The less they forgive themselves, the, the more they procrastinated. So forgiveness rather than guilt is what allowed to overcome procrastination and improve their grades. Self-criticism backfires as a strategy for self-control. As like other forms of stress, it drags you straight to comfort coping activities like bench eating ice cream or watching TV instead of finishing that project. And not just this study, in a lot of research comes out that how harder you are on yourself about having a willpower failure, the more likely you are to have the same failure again. And the bigger it's gonna be when you do. For instance, one study took a look at problem drinkers and had them keep track on how much, how bad they were feeling the morning after. So they found that people who were the most self-critical felt the most ashamed or guilty about drinking the night before, wanted to drink more immediately. There was something about the self-critical nature, shame, the guilt that was driving people to go back to the very thing they felt bad about. Same has been shown as quitting smoking. When you have your first relapse, the more you beat yourself up about it, the more you now need to be comforted with something, probably with that very thing that you're now feeling bad about, because that's probably why you did it in the first place. The same has been shown for gambling. The more people feel guilty and self-critical about losing money, the more likely they are to borrow money and try to win it back and end up losing more. You may not have any addictions, but even for procrastination. So all this has to do with the basic fact that when we're feeling stressed out and guilty and ashamed that's the state that puts us into the version of ourselves the mindset that's much more susceptible to our immediate gratification and temptation and anxiety so what kind of self-compassion message can you give yourself so there's three things the first thing is mindfulness of thought mindfulness of thoughts and feelings the second one is common humanity the third one is encouragement over criticism so the first one mindfulness over thoughts and feelings is when you are critical or angry with yourself is to see those feelings because a big reason that people go from feeling guilty to to giving in again they just want to get rid of that feeling it's so overwhelming and they just want to distract themselves from it with something that's going to get them into further trouble the second step common humanity one of the reasons it's hard to find our motivation and our willpower is we start to feel like there's something uniquely broken with us there's something about who we are that is wrong and weak and that mindset makes it very difficult to tap back into your motivation or your strength and so this message of common humanity is basically saying to yourself you know what this is part of the process of change this is how things get done sometimes we procrastinate sometimes we fall off the wagon everyone is imperfect and to recognize that this is not saying anything about who you are it's saying something about the process and what matters is is how you respond afterwards not the fact that it happened at all and this last step is encouragement over criticism if you were to think about someone you were mentoring or a child or a dear friend what would you say to them when they had a setback and say the same thing to yourself and actually trying to talk to yourself in the second person as if you were a good friend and research shows that this particular approach talking to yourself in this way is more effective for example for quitting smoking than the nicotine replacement therapy that's how powerful being able to respond to setbacks with self-compassion can be also not being too optimistic helps most optimistic smokers are more likely to fail and when you're optimistic about future behavior that basically licenses your self-indulgement today so how can you be more realistic than optimistic so write down every day what is your goal what would be the most positive outcome what action will I take to reach this goal and write down what's the biggest obstacle and when and where is this obstacle most likely to occur what can I do to prevent the obstacle and what specific thing will I do to get back to my goal when this obstacle happens how do you know how much willpower you have. You can test it by holding your breath. The ability to hold your breath is one of the best predictors of people's ability to succeed a difficult goal. Kind of interesting. 
Psychologists call this distress tolerance. The ability to stay put when things get uncomfortable. You increase your willpower also by a technique called serve the urge. Serving the urge in, in where you learn to pay attention to the physical discomfort of wanting something. You give it your full attention and you trust that you can tolerate these physical sensations. And if you just wait with patience, they will go away. That any craving, any emotion will eventually pass if you can just breathe and wait it out. You don't have to act on any impulse or emotion. So that's an, a technique that one of the groups were doing research were taught to how to handle craving, how to serve the urge, allow yourself to feel the craving and yet remember you don't need to act on it and the craving will go away eventually. In this study, the smokers who've been taught to serve the urge, they ended up reducing their cigarette smoke by 40% in the next week, even though the researchers hadn't asked them to. The control group did not reduce their cigarettes at all. And interestingly, the people that learned to serve the urge, there was no longer a connection to psychological stress and smoking, which is actually, that's the main connection for a lot of people who are trying to quit. They're stressed out, they're anxious, that's why they need a cigarette and with this particular group with this intervention it cut that link between stress and giving in probably because they had a tool for dealing with difficult feelings and emotions so the five willpower rules one train your willpower physiology by meditating sleeping exercising eating a diet that sustain your energy levels Two, forgive yourself the next time you have a willpower setback make friends with your future self Kind of think about the future in a way that feels real. For instance, visualize yourself in the future. Visualize having a conversation with your future self. Even something as small as visualize yourself going for grocery shopping in the future. Or predict your failure. Even though it's really nice to imagine success, really get interested in the process of how you fail. And then finally, surfing the urge. So when you are facing temptation. That was the core message that I gathered from Kelly's book, The Willpower Instinct. It's a great resource source for killing procrastination. I highly recommend it. Thank you so much for listening and have a productive day.